again, this has been a journey for me, so it's interesting. If you read some of my early writings on um, single tasking or focus or doing one thing at a time, it was all about trying to pare back the chaos of the world. Like there's so much going on and you're just jumping around and it's just like, okay, let me, let me focus on one thing and just be fully there with that and just be more effective with that task, also just giving it my full attention. Um, and so that was one thing was about effectiveness and productivity and, and mindfulness kind of all blended together and simplicity. These days, it's, it's less about the efficiency and, and the focus and more about how I relate to the world around me. And often it's constant distractions, uh, checking the phone, checking the computer, um, and just not paying attention to you know, what's here right now. <laughs> also, as I relate to it, Am I relating to it in a way where I'm like rejecting it or clinging to something or am I being open-hearted towards whatever it is that's there? And so, yeah, as, as I've learned about this, it's been a really important practice for me. It's just saying, okay, right now I'm gonna just sit and just meditate. And I notice my mind like wanting to go off to all the different things that I have to do today instead of just sitting and just meditating. But as I've learned how to do that, I've learned like I can just drink this water and, and have a glass of water and just pay attention to the process of drinking that water. And that transforms that one sim simple experience, but I can also just be there as, some, as my kid talks to me and just pay attention to them rather than be like, okay, 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 and do other things while they're talking to me. And just doing that, I think, is an act of love, of just giving them my full attention and just listening to them. And it's something that I have often not done um, and I find that to be uh, a disrespectful thing when you don't give someone your full attention. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. If I think that this work is worth doing, if I'm going to write something, then isn't it worth doing with my full attention rather than disrespecting it by jumping around to different things? If I think that taking a shower is worth doing, isn't it worth doing with my full attention or washing a dish or going for a walk rather than being on my phone the whole time, just being there on that walk. So yeah, that's that's kind of been a, a, a thing that's transformed my relationship with not only the world around me, but with the people around me and, and myself, like I said. This is episode 13 of the Own Stream podcast featuring Leo Babauta. Welcome to the Own Stream podcast. That was the truly uh, amazing Leo Babauta, and I'm Stephen Shelley. I'm Teresa Scoba. And we're so happy to share with you our conversation with Leo. And many of you may know who Leo is and um, may have read his book or certainly checked out his blog. I, I think between the two of us, I, I think I stumbled across Leo first and then shared his blog with Teresa, but um, he's been around for a long time and um, has amassed quite a following online through his wonderful, simple, elegant, beautiful website, Zen Habits. And we were introduced to Leo, I guess, more personally through our mutual friend, Tynan, who was uh, obviously an earlier podcast guest and a friend of mine. And he and Leo are, I think, I guess they met in San Francisco. I know they they're both big into tea, so maybe they met over tea. <laughs> In fact, when you book Leo for a conversation, you're having virtual tea, so that's kind of charming. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and they're both they both have a lot in common, and, and we have a lot in common with Leo, and it was a really really great conversation. Yeah, I remember Stephen. Um, as you've heard me say, I think in these uh, conversations before, um, I remember Stephen uh, introducing me to Leo. Um, what I mean is that Stephen's always finding uh, inspiration on the internet. I tend to have a love love hate affair with the internet as much as it's given me access to thank goodness as we talk about to voices of inspiration and expansion. Um, I also just spend a lot of time on the computer and sometimes feel trapped by that. But um, <laughs> Leo has lots of good tips. <laughs> but um, anyway, I remember Stephen. Um, finding Leo's blogs and habits, um, where he talks really elegantly about uh, living a more simple, 
mindful life. And we were living in New York City at the time and feeling, I think, especially, we may have even just, I, I'm associating it with coming back from a one of our, our vacation breaks where we would typically go away for a week and maybe by the time, like take three days to detox, three or four days to detox from our New York City life and then like achieve some stillness. We may have been reading Leo's book even. Um, and and then coming back to New York City and re-entering and trying to find that uh, calm and stillness in the madness. And so I remember um, just feeling this sense of calm and resonance and um, presence reading Leo's blog and his book, The Power of Less, um, thinking about how um, Stephen and I used to talk about all the time, how we wanted to simplify our lives and felt really gravitating toward that. Um, and so... We started to read Leo's blog and we found out that we have really a lot in common, which emerged in this in this great interview. Um, there was so much to talk about. We didn't even get to uh, unschooling, which is something we're very yeah. interested in now with our um, almost one year old baby. Um, we're not at the point of schooling yet, but we've certainly started to hear all of the voices and recommendations about schooling. And we have lots of interest in um, alternative methods to schooling. I think if we could track Leo's career as a writer, you would start with, uh, you know, his his whole journey, if you will, and he'll get into this much more in detail, started with kicking the smoking habit. And it just sort of struck him like, wow, there's a real process here for changing habits. And, you know, and I think it, it kind of f- flowed naturally from there. Once he quit smoking, he dealt with other things and that emerged into his blog. And now he has a readership of over 2 million subscribers to his website. So he's a big, big presence online has helped a lot, a lot of people. And, you know, early on in his career, I guess his, his, his mantra was do one thing at a time and the power of focus, which, um, is helpful really to anybody, anybody in this day and age dealing with the amount of technology and media and information coming at us can benefit from that. And now, as you've just kind of gleaned, I think from that intro quote of his, he's really focused on now that his life has largely kind of formed itself in a meaningful way to him. He's no longer you know, doing something that doesn't really resonate for him. He's doing things he loves to do. His time is really more shaped by his desires and what he really likes to do. And so now he really wants to be there for those moments and really be as undistracted and present as possible, (laughs) which I think is if the first part of his business was the habit side, now it seems to be maybe more the Zen side. So if you bring those together, I'm looking at Teresa to see if she'll laugh, but she's not. (laughs) I thought I was being really clever there. Anyway, so the habits came first and now the Zen, so the Zen habits. Anyway, this is life with Steven, by the way. Um, (laughs) Constantly fishing for humor to crack my wife up. Um, (laughs) But, you know, we had a lot in common and uh, Leo and, and, and us, uh, simplicity, minimalism, you know, he inspired, he was veganism. part of the veganism, he was part of what inspired us to really pare down and travel the way that we've done. And, and it's, it's, we're, we, the bottom line is we're really, really honored to talk to Leo. He's in the, the minimalist movie, which came out a few months ago. If you haven't seen that, that is on Netflix. Um, I think it's called Everything That Remains. We'll link to it. But he's in there. Colin Bevan's in there, prior podcast guest. So Leo's a, a you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a real leader in the world of reducing and conscious living, I think is probably the way I would put it. Yeah, and he's, he's a, a clear, clear hit on so many areas of own streams, interests, and lifestyle. But he also is one of those people who um, sort of developed an online business just starting to talk about his own experience mm. and his passion and his, he just started writing, you know, and he found, you know, as is sort of the beautiful experience of a lot of people who start to just um, share their experience with the world via online platform, that what he had to say and what his experience was resonated with so many people mm-hmm. that he now has what a two million readers, two million, yeah. um, and so he he very organically developed a business and he talks, you know he, I think his mission is very similar to ours though you know our approaches are different um, but similar that he really he says now that he's found that his you know his. I don't know if he used the word calling, but his he's found that his what he reson he does he did that his calling is to um, help people um, 
uh, surpass their struggles, deal with their struggles. And, you know, he has a wealth of experience from his own um, many years of kicking one habit of, at a time and finding more Zen to help people uh, reduce their struggles. And he talks about how, you know, you just look at your deepest pain and go kind of right at that. Um, and um, by doing that, you achieve more freedom. Yeah, I think you're going to get a lot out of this conversation. Uh, Leo is a wealth of knowledge. Um, and he and he's he's also a very, very good interview. He really talks beautifully about his experience, his life. He's clearly very experienced. And so uh, we're happy to share this with you, honored to share this with you. Uh, we'll be back afterwards, of course, to wrap up. But until then, enjoy this great conversation with Leo Babauta. I guess I should start by thanking Tynan, our mutual pal, who's oh um, yeah, he's um he was our third podcast guest. He and I are friends from a while ago, and um, I've known him for at least a decade or more. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, props to him for for helping us get connected. And um, you know, Leo, you're you're a, a, a real leader in the world that we kind of look at and occupy, and. I think you first kind of came on onto my radar screen, I don't know, a number of years ago. Um, and, I, and I seem to recall Seth Godin mentioning you on his blog, and I went to your blog, and I was immediately just uh, in love with the design and simplicity and how seamless the message tied mm-hmm. into that. And um, anyway, sure. so I've, we've, I've followed you since then, and I, we bought your book uh, <clears throat> some years ago. I think it's been out for, for a few years, and we, we read that, and... And it's been inspiring us, and uh, so <clears throat> thank you for being on our podcast. And this is this is a real thrill for both Teresa and I, no doubt. Yeah, no, and uh, I want to thank Tynan too. He's one of my my best friends, and Seth Godin is one of the bloggers I admire most. So two great names that you threw out there. <laughs> yeah, man, we're off to a good start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I am uh, happy to be here and grateful that you guys had me on. It's an honor. Well, thank you. Um, well, I guess to get started, uh, I think I love how your your um, your about me page or your I think it's called my story is is sort of perfect for a podcast interviewer to kind of begin to enter into your your journey because you've got things so clearly marked and and so I'd love to talk or hear you talk about kind of what your life was like before what seems to have been a very pivotal moment about. 12 years ago when you stopped smoking. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. kind of let's, let's get a view of what, what was like before that. And then maybe what inspired and, and allowed for you to quit smoking. And then we can talk more about what's happened since then. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of changes happened after that, but, uh, before that, yeah, it was, I mean, I want I don't want to say my life was horrible. Um, I, I was married with kids and, uh, you know, definitely had a lot of love in my life. But I also had a lot of struggle uh, with changing things about my life. Uh, you mentioned smoking. I had tried to quit like seven times and failed at it. And I kept thinking, oh, this is not going to be a problem. And then it, it was. <laughs> um, and so I always thought I had discipline. And then whenever I tried to make changes, I realized that that discipline wasn't there or it wasn't what I thought it was. Um, I was gaining weight rapidly and alarmingly. And so uh, I was about... 60, 70 pounds heavier than I am now. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was, it wasn't just that I had that weight on me, but it was like, I didn't know how to change it. I tried to exercise and I couldn't stick to any exercise pr- uh, programs. Um, I tried every diet that I had, I could run across in a magazine <laughs> and, uh, none of those stuck very long. Um, and it wasn't just health. It was debt. The debt was actually probably one of the worst, most stressful things for me because it was climbing and I had no way of paying it off. I was living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I, uh, you know, couldn't make ends meet. I had to borrow money from family uh, just to put food on the table. I, um, I was avoiding calls because creditors were trying to track me down. So that was so stressful, and I just felt so bad about my life at the time. Um, and that, those were just some of the the problems. I also. Um, was working too long and didn't have time for my my wife and kids, and of course that puts strains on a relationship and um, all kinds of problems like that. And so it was just like this feeling of my life 
should be a lot better and I don't know how to change it. I feel stuck and just kind of hopeless. And so that's where I was when I started out uh, making this journey of change in 2005. And so what changed? I mean, I think a lot of people can identify with that, right? Uh, you know, yeah. uh, patterns that don't serve them. Uh, they feel heavy, weighed down, unhappy. They want to change but can't. Like what What happened that, that you made that successful change? And then what happened after that? Yeah, so I... I realized I had probably like a dozen to two dozen uh, things I wanted to change in my life. And I kept trying to change a bunch of them at once and it just wasn't working. And so I'm like, okay, I, there's got to be a way to make this work. You know, I'm not the world's biggest loser. I mean, I don't think anyone is, but <laughs> I just felt like I felt like such a loser. I'm like, I, I can do this. You know, there's something that can be done. I don't know what it is. And so I decided okay, I'm going to really just focus everything into one change. And so I, I picked smoking, and I now know from having worked with lots of habits that smoking is probably not the best place to start because it's mm. it's a really hard one. Tough one to change, um, yeah. Yeah, but I did it, actually, and, and it worked. But I what I decided to do was focus just on that one and really commit myself and do a bunch of research. So I looked at, like, the American Cancer Society uh, recommendations. And I even looked into different, uh, research done on how to quit, um, different organizations. I went online to, to, uh, forums where people were quitting and asked them for tips and read a lot. And I just said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to combine a lot of this stuff into a plan and make it work. And I actually set a date that was like, I think three weeks in the future. Uh, so it was November 18, 2005. Uh, so it was, you know, end of October is when I, I set that date and I said three weeks from now, that's my quit date. And I marked it on the calendar and I made like this big day. Um, and I did all this preparation before for those three weeks and including trying to figure out what my triggers were that triggered me to have the urge to smoke, um, replacement habits for each one of those triggers and just increasing awareness and having strategies and getting an accountability buddy and getting active on these forums and asking them for help. So I did a lot of stuff. And uh, basically uh, put everything I had into it and it worked and it was hard, mm. <laughs> but it worked. And it really, one of the things that it did was just boost my self-confidence and, and improve my self-image into this person who was like this total loser and can't make anything stick to someone who actually made one thing stick. And then I changed, uh, I started writing um, and I started uh, changing my diet and getting out of debt one at a time. And each one of those, I realized that the same things that worked with smoking worked with each one of those other things. And I just started knocking off these habits one at a time for more than a year. And then that's when I started Zen Habits was just to share those amazing things that I had found to work. Um, and I was so excited about them that I, I'm like, I, I have to share this with others. And it turned out that resonated with people. Yeah, it certainly did. You know, um, I, I, I'm curious to hear <clears throat> kind of um, – the genesis of the blog and um, kind of when did you realize that people were reading this and that this was becoming a, a, a business? Like, I mean, I think there sure. are a lot of people out there who write for on, on their own personal blogs, but this has become one of the most read blogs in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what what sure. was that little what was that journey like? Because uh, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, it was a complete surprise to me. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was the end of 2006. I had just um, I'd been through a year plus of change. I had r run my first marathon, lost you know maybe 30 pounds at that point, um, and was a lot further along the, the way on all my other habits like getting out of debt and stuff. So I had gone through some massive personal change in a, a really short time. You know, just you know, 11 months or so. And so, I mean, uh, 13 or 14 months or so. And so I was like, okay, what do I do next? I just finished my marathon. How can I keep this going? And so I decided to start the blog, share some of the things I've been learning, maybe create some accountability for the further changes I wanted to make. Cause I was still in the middle of the journey and, uh, you know, maybe connect with other people who were learning, uh, like I was. And so that's what it was. And I posted a lot of things like here, are the, you know, I was trying to get out of debt. So I like, here are the things I spent on today. <laughs> and so I just like a lot of posts like that, just sharing um, what I was doing at the time, but also 
what I had been learning. Like, here are some things that helped me to stay motivated. Mm. And so, yeah, in the, in the beginning, it was just sharing and connecting. And uh, it wasn't a lot. It was my mom and my wife were my first two readers. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I actually got a link from a couple of bigger blogs after a month or, or two into it, and those really shot up the uh, number of readers. Mm. And once that happened, and people were really connecting and responding to the uh, things that I was sharing you know, that helped them in their lives, and they were excited about making these changes too, um, it started to spark this like inspiration in me, like, wow, th maybe this can be something that I do. And I, I think it was about three months into it, when the blog was actually really starting to take off, um, I realized like maybe this could be my calling. I had already been a writer before that, but now I was writing in a, in a whole new way where I was sharing my journey and the things I was learning and helping other people to uh, change their lives. And I was like, this could be my calling. This could be the thing that I do. And so I like went into overdrive at that point. <laughs> and <laughs> for, the end of, for the rest of the year, 2007, I just completely tried to make that my job and it worked. I had like 27,000 subscribers by the end of the year. I quit my day job. I signed a book deal. I sold my first ebook and got out of debt. Um, and yeah, it was just a massive year of success for me. And it was, uh, I, I can't believe that it happened. I still can't. And I'm still super grateful that it did. <laughs> Oh, it's so awesome. And it's so exciting to have that feeling. Like, can you talk a little bit? We talk a lot about calling and finding your calling and really going after that. Can you can you talk a little bit about a little more, I guess, about that moment of like, oh, I think this is my calling. Like, how did yeah. you realize that? And like, uh, yeah, how did you realize that? Well, I, you know, I had been stuck in different jobs that I, I definitely did not feel like it was my calling. And you know, it was like one of those ones where you punch in and do the work and then leave and you're like exhausted, but you don't feel like you've done anything meaningful. And so that was kind of the mode that I had been in for a number of jobs. Uh, and I just didn't feel like I had any purpose in, in any of that stuff. My purpose was my family, but the, the work part of it was just something I had to do. And so when I started the blog and people were responding to it, and I actually I got some amazing comments where people would be like, you know, this, I put this into action and it's starting to change my life. And they were so excited. And I felt so gratified to be a part of that change in their lives. Um, you know, not only my own changes, which I knew how, uh, you know, what a big difference that could make. But when I saw other people take what I was sharing and put it into action, it was like, wow, I get to be a part of that incredible process for someone. And it just felt meaningful. Like the work I was doing I was excited to get up early in the morning to start writing this stuff before I had to go to the day job and before the kids woke up because I had, you know, babies at the time. And so I just I felt like this was something that I really got meaning out of. I really wanted to do that. I was inspired to do that. I just was full of energy. And I talked to my wife about it just with all of this enthusiasm. And she could tell just by the lit up look on my face that this is something that, that I you know, felt like this is finally something that I had discovered that I wanted to do. Um, and I could see myself doing this into old age, never needing to retire. <laughs> um, and so that was just like, well, if this could be my calling, um, I would be so happy to quit my job and do this all the time. And of course, then it was, the question was like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> and so I started reading like people on like how to become a pro blogger and um, all these money-making kinds of um, bloggers and entrepreneurs online who teach you how to do that. And a lot of it uh, I tried and it didn't work and it didn't really resonate with me. And so it was a matter of, of experimentation until I found out how to do it in a way that really felt in alignment with my, you know, with wanting to be authentic and do it in a genuine way. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was amazing to discover it. That's very cool. Um, I want to um, <clears throat> hear a little more about that because what I'm struck by as you're describing these th these early posts and the early part of the of Zen Habits is the fact that it seems to me that you were very candid, like you were very clear about ex you know what you spent your money on, what you ate, and like ex like a, a lot of um, cand candidness. You know, there was no veil there, if you will. Whereas I think a lot yeah. of marketing is a lot about 
you know, may, maybe putting up some really flashy barriers or veils between you and the customer, whereas yours is very transparent. What did that feel like, number one, <clears throat> doing that? And then number two, maybe talk about <clears throat> the 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 reality of, of how excited people are to watch someone transform, whether that's on a blog or on a TV show, and how that mm-hmm. has become for you such a vibrant and <clears throat> inspiring business for other people. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are great questions. Uh, so to, to open my life up, like you're talking about sharing not only what I spent, which, uh, actually, I mean, when I, when I shared some of that stuff, I would get some criticism sometimes. Mm. Um, so that was kind of scary as like, okay, I'm going to put out everything that I spend here on the blog. And, you know, it's kind of like opening your, your life up to the world. Um, and if, like I said, in the beginning, it wasn't a lot of people, so it wasn't that scary. Um, to start with, but as the blog grew, just being this open book to the world um, was, I think, a pretty scary thing to do for me. Uh, but I, I grew more and more comfortable with just opening up like that and um, sharing the, you know, the kind of behind the scenes of the process. And not only was it scary, it was also liberating. Mm-hmm. So it was like, well, if I'm honest with you, I don't have all the answers. I don't have any secrets that I can share. All I can do is share my journey, and it's going to be messy. Um, it's full of mistakes and not knowing, and at the same time, it's also full of learning and you know getting inspired and finding joy in the world. And that's that's all I can share with you, and that's my life. That's who I am, and um, I, I like that um, because, like I said, it's, it was liberating to not have to pretend to be someone that I wasn't. Mm. And if you just kind of open yourself up and say, "This is who I am." Of course, you can't ever show, share the entirety of who you are, but this is who I am that I'm willing to share with you. Um, you know, it's like I can't – you can't actually fail because it's not like I'm going to pretend to be someone and then try, try and convince people that I'm that person. It's just being who you are. Um, and so I try, I try my best to do that. I, I have failed a numerous times to, uh, to actually, you know, share exactly who I am and um, – I think sometimes I've done things that are inauthentic, so I don't want to pretend that I'm perfect at this. Sure. But I, I do find that to be when I do it to the extent that I do that, um, I find it liberating and just a relief to not have the burden of trying to pretend to be this incredible success that I'm not. <laughs> I'm just a regular guy going through a journey just like anybody else. And if I can share things that that help people that I've been learning along the way, then I I find that to be a really gratifying thing. Um, but your second question was about, uh, w- what it was like when people took that. I forget exactly. Well, I think it's, you know, the, the, so much of what happens online, at least the things that are inspiring to us. And it sounds mm-hmm. like you too, is when people are very forthright and candid and, mm-hmm. and I think there's a hunger out there for people, for transformation, for real stories of transformation. How, yeah. how do you do that? And um, I think when I think of you, I think of someone who is, you know, very clear about what that transformation looks like, what that process is. And that kind of value is far greater than any kind of marketing strategy, I would imagine. Um, Sure. I guess, like, what is the feeling of knowing you have this kind of impact on people through what is a very simple platform, a blog on your on a website? Yeah. Um, You know, it's. I am just blown away whenever I find out that I do have that impact because uh, I'm sure you guys know the, the experience. Um, as, as a writer, I just write what I hope is helpful and put it out there in the world. And then you don't really know what's going to happen with it. <laughs> Maybe it'll just go into a, you know, a vacuum, a, you know, this empty chamber and there will be no, no reaction. Uh, or maybe people will hate it and you know, trash you. Or maybe they'll think it's pretty cool and then never do anything about it. But maybe there'll be a few people who take it and actually do something with it and it'll have a positive impact on their lives. And I've been lucky enough to get people give me the feedback that there are some things that I've, I've written that have changed their lives in pretty profound ways. Um, and again, like I said, I had no idea that that would happen. But when it does, it's like I, I just I'm blown away by it. Um, I've been moved to tears when I meet people in in person and they tell me about uh, things that have changed in their lives that 
you know, I had no idea I was doing. And I, actually, there's no way I could have uh, made that happen, even if I knew I wanted to do that. Um, it just put it out there in the world and see what happens. Uh, but when they share that with me, it's just such a moving thing. Uh, because I know what it's like to struggle. Um, when I talked about my life before the changes, it, there was a lot of, uh, you know, feeling really bad about myself and not knowing how to change a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, um, going to addictions to distract myself from all of these, you know, pain points, uh, any, all, all this pain that I had about myself. And so when I see people who've made some progress, whether it's, you know, they're just starting out or they've come so far along the journey. Um, and I know what it's like to go from that place of pain to a place of feeling like there's some hope and some liberation. Uh, I just feel just floored, basically. That's, that's the only word I can think of. Flooring and gratifying. Sounds like pursuing a calling. <laughs> yeah, that's right, right. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about your, your personal transformation. You know, we, um, so there's been so many aspects, so many habits that you've taken on one by one. And I don't, I'm interested to know where you're even going from here, because I'm sure that there's, I'm sure that as you start to, you know, refine as one might think to maybe closer to your true essence or however you identify that there's, yeah. there's more and more things that emerge, even when you hit the grosser, more obvious ones. Right. So can you talk a little bit about, we know that, you know, fitness and diet have been a huge part. Minimalism is a huge part. You know, mm -hmm. you've given up your car and, 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 and ride a bike. Um, talk to us a little bit about kind of, you know, you started with smoking, you know, how you, how did you pick each thing you were working on and, and how has that happened one by one and how do they interplay in your life? Like how does, how does one reinforce the other? Yeah. Well, it's a really complex question, but uh, <laughs> it's a really good one too, though. So um, how did I pick, you know, it was just, it was just, uh, in the beginning, it was just pick the things that I was struggling with the most that I really wanted to change about my, my life and myself. And so a lot of it was just unhappiness with who I was and where I was. Um, and again, you know, diet, smoking, uh, exercise, debt, clutter was another one and simplifying my life. And so as I did these, I started to feel better and better about myself. And so after a while, I, I started to realize that these were all like external things that I was trying to change. Um, and it was amazing to change them, but the real work that was going on was internal. Um, and so it was really just trying to uh, improve the relationship that I had with myself mm. um, and how I felt about myself and how I saw myself. And so that, that became more of the journey. And so the, the external stuff just became a way to work with the internal stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I just, I just continued to want to learn about how to do that, how to, you know, love myself and be kind to myself and be a friend to myself. Um, but at the same time, work on the, uh, things that the external things do matter. It's not like they're all just superficial. They, they actually have an effect on your life and your relationship with others. And so improving my finances improved a lot of things about my life, including the ability to, you know, travel and, uh, do all kinds of other things. Um, becoming minimalist helped me to just really change my relationship with my possessions and all the things that I do in life. Uh, and so that, it was really all about that. It was just learning um, about how um, I relate to myself, relate to others, and relate to um, my external world. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's been a, a journey. And I think lately it's been more... Um, more internal where I am, uh, you know, I, I, right now I'm doing like a lean out diet where I'm trying to get a little bit leaner. Um, cause I've been loose and I've gained, gained some fat, but honestly, that's not the, the, ex, the way that I, I look is not as important anymore to me as, as it used to be. Uh, maybe you could say it's because I've, I've come a long way, uh, physically, but I think it's more, um, I, I'm doing this lean out diet, because I think it's healthy for me, but also because I want to understand my eating patterns better. Mm. Uh, and so again, it's my relationship to food that I'm, I'm really looking at. And I, I think the lean out diet that I'm doing is like a way for me to see when I'm trying to get away from the meal plan and like eat some junk food or something like that. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. And then like, why am I trying to eat that junk food? What's, what's going on there? And if I can understand that, then, um, 
you know, it, it to, again, it transforms that relationship. So uh, that's, that's been a big thing, but I'm also going more inward um, so that I'm learning about, uh, well, Zen and Buddhism have been a big part of it and mindfulness uh, where I'm learning more about how to not only like stay with the present, but how to relate to the present moment um, in a, a more loving way, a more accepting way and, and a bunch of other stuff into that. I don't know if you want me to get into that. But, uh, yeah, so how do all of these um, relate to each other? Or like, what's the dynamic between all of these different things that I've been changing? Um, it's, I think it's it's really just a, a process of self-learning. They, they work together in, in various ways. Um, that is very complex. But really, it all comes down to how I'm learning um, to deal, to relate to everything. So I, I think that's how they interact with each other. Well, I'd love to um, just hear you talk a little bit more about your uh, your diet. We're vegan, have been All for right. a number of years, uh, imperfectly, uh, yeah. partic- particularly uh, yours truly. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> you know, for us, it was, I guess it was a health thing initially that, yeah. that launched us into this interest <clears throat> and then – all these other kind of dimensions revealed themselves, disease and fitness and sleep and all these, uh, there's just wonderful kind of side effects to just, and also, you know, ethics regarding animals and farming and all of that. What was it like for you? What were you, what was, what was your diet before that? And then maybe what prompted that change? And, and since then, what has, what is your health and what has your physical experience been like? Yeah. Um, so I got into it for health reasons, but, uh, these days, uh, m- almost my only reason is the ethical one that you mentioned, the compassion for animals. Um, just so just to clarify that I don't do it for health reasons right now. Um, but I got into it for, like, like you said, uh, before that I, I was overweight and actually I was addicted to junk food. <laughs> I was very, very into junk food. Uh, lots of lots of meat for sure, but also just lots of fried stuff, lots of snacking on stuff, lots of pizza. Uh, we would go out to the movies and I would get soda and popcorn and candy and yep. nachos. Um, yep. And so, yeah, that was that was my life, and it, it definitely was not working for me health wise. I was uh, getting less and less healthy, and not only overweight, but um, just not feeling good most of the time. Not not a lot of energy. Um, and just, uh, I, I think it was just causing, making me sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I, uh, I changed for that reason. I started a uh, vegetarian because it just seemed healthier to eat a lot of vegetables. And so I did that, but of course I, I ate a, a vegetarian diet that had not only cheese and, and eggs and milk and stuff like that, but, um, lots of processed, you know, junk food that, uh, they make for vegetarians. Um, and, uh, so you can definitely be a vegan and a junk food vegan, you know? (laughs) And so that, that actually did it help because I was eating more vegetables, uh, which I wasn't before. Um, and it started to help me to lose weight. But as I started to learn about health, I started letting go of a lot of the processed stuff. Um, and, and I still eat processed stuff today. It's not like I'm perfect at that at all. Um, in fact, my kids just ate, uh, some vegan, uh, chicken, nugget things and I, I snuck two of them. <laughs> so I, I, I have still have uh, some of my old relationship with food uh, has not completely changed. But anyway, so I, st- I have started, I mean, I, over the years I've uh, become better and better at getting away from the processed stuff. Um, I still love, like I said, pizza and things like that. But um, it's, it's really had a profound effect on my health. It's just not only the weight loss, but the energy that I mentioned and just having more clarity and focus during the day. Um, I, I feel like a completely different person. I actually am a completely different person from where, where I started. And so, yeah, it's had great effects on me. I've, I've learned a lot about health just through researching uh, vegetarianism and then veganism. And veganism is something that I kind of slowly approached um, and was like mostly vegan for a couple of years. And then in 2012, um, I was trying to convince my wife to go vegan. And we had two vegan friends like you guys who uh, came in and visited with us. And we had so much good vegan food that she's like, oh, I could eat like this all the time. <laughs> and so she went from 
she went from a meat eater to pescatarian to vegetarian, and then in 2012, uh, we um, both went completely vegan, and we haven't gone back since. And so, yeah, it's been a great thing because we've learned not only a lot about um, being a vegan and you know vegan uh, nutrition, which it's it's a good thing to learn about if you're becoming vegan. But also just like the ethics of it. And we started watching videos, which I'm sure you guys have seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's like once you watch these videos, you can't unwatch them. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> I know the one you're speaking of. Teresa won't watch it. I can watch it. Uh, <laughs> so it's like at that point, it's like you can either just push it down to the darkest re- you know, depths of your, your mind and say, okay, I don't want to think about that ever again. Or it's like, okay, I need, I need to change how I relate to food. Um, and so that, that was a process for me, just like l- educating myself and understanding what the food industry is like and what we're doing to animals and uh, how we treat them. So I um, started to learn about that. And then that became, to me, it just became um, a quick switch that I flipped. It's like, okay, I've seen now how animals are treated and I am a part of that. And I want to stop being a part of it to the extent that I can. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just can't find it. I couldn't think of a single good reason to keep doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, you can be very healthy on a vegan diet. Um, you know, there's the environmental aspect of it as well. And so there's just like, I am completely happy being vegan, not only healthy, but I actually love the food that I'm eating. And I'm not, I don't feel deprived at all. I don't feel like I'm missing out on anything. Um, it's a delicious way to live life. And so I started living like that. I'm like, okay, well, there's no, then there's no reason for me to eat meat, Mm -hmm. um, or, or have any animal products. So it was just when I, once I realized that, then it was just a easy journey from there. Yeah. I I mean, we've had a very similar journey and also very similar. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. Even when you talked about like, you know, you you ate with that couple friends of yours and oh, this beautiful food, you know, I mean, Stephen makes fun of me because I'm such a geek about like the colors of plant based food. But when you eat a really beautiful plant based meal, there's it's a really like, I don't know, energetically uh, high experience. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, uh, these days I appreciate, you know, plant food so much more than I used to. It, it used to be like this thing that I had to eat if I had to eat it, you know, or, or didn't want to at all. But now I look at like a bunch of kale and I think it's like a bouquet of flowers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I never appreciated kale before, but now I, I have great appreciation for it <laughs> we're gonna play that little clip for our parents <laughs> so they understand why we get so excited about vegetables <laughs> yeah you know and, and like berries like i look at berries I, i've always loved berries but now i look at them like other people look at like you know molten chocolate cake or something like that like i look at berries i'm like oh my god my mouth is water uh, yeah so yeah, all, right. all kinds of great plant food. <laughs> well, we're right there with you. Um, we uh, we want to ask you too about um, your work on minimalism and decluttering. You know, we we know you have six kids, yeah. and we we just have one. <laughs> but we but it's caused us to you know uh, take an, a fresh look at at this because we've both worked to simplify. We've spent some time traveling, actually inspired by Tynan with very small backpacks. We've been interested in tiny houses. We're exploring again, you know, living in a, a small space, uh, much smaller than our, our current 900 square foot condo. So we're just curious, you know, how, how you've implemented those changes in your life, particularly um, raising such a large family and, you know, what that's been like for you and your family. Yeah, well, minimalism is definitely a relative term, especially when it comes to me. <laughs> uh, yeah, Titan uh, being a minimalist and me being one, those are just completely different worlds. <laughs> he, I mean, as you guys know, he lived in an RV for years. Uh, I think he just finally sold it, but but he still lives in a pretty small place. Um, but yeah, he's a bachelor. You're like, I can't yeah. relate to that kind of world. Um, and, you know, having one kid, it it's, it's completely different than being a bachelor. Uh, being married with with a kid, and when you have a bunch of kids, um, I think the first thing that comes up for most people is like, how could he call himself a minimalist with six kids? <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, I had the kids before I discovered minimalism and simplicity. <laughs> so, and it turns out you can't just donate them to Goodwill. Um, <laughs> so I, I I'm stuck with the kids, but uh, the um, the uh, the rest of the stuff is all negotiable. So. Yeah, you know, it's it's been an interesting journey 
trying to simplify my life with a wife and kids. And, you know, even if I just had the wife, she, when we first started out, did not want to get rid of all her stuff. And I'm like, you don't need any of that stuff. We'll wear like a loincloth and <laughs> uh, with one, one outfit. But, it, but um, she wanted to hold on to her, her dresses and shoes. And honestly, I don't blame her. You know, that's trying, someone trying to take away your valuables is probably not um, a good thing. So I decided just to simplify my stuff. And then eventually she, she kind of got inspired by that and decided to simplify her stuff, but at her own pace and without me trying to like say, oh, you can't have this. Um, and so I, I tried to never get involved with what she decided to get rid of, but just um, share my journey with her and hope that, you know, maybe she would be inspired to share it with me. So she has, um, but at, again, at her own pace and in her own way. And, um, and then we started to do that with the kids. I started sharing how I was simplifying my life and, um, you know, sharing ways that they, they could do that. And since they were young, they're very open to different fun, uh, games and challenges that we could make out of it. So we would like make challenges of how we could go through and find toys that they hadn't played with in the last few months that they could give to other kids who might, might appreciate them more. Um, yeah. And and we've done a whole bunch of different kinds of things like that just to kind of make it fun and not something where they're like having to lose all of their possessions. Um, when we moved to San Francisco, we were really excited, uh, from Guam where we were living. We, it's hard to go without a car on Guam, but in San Francisco, we decided as a family that we would try at least for a little while living without a car, walking, biking, uh, and taking transit everywhere and we actually loved it it was a great way to get to know a new city and we lived our entire time there uh with no uh car we do have one now just to be clear uh we moved to davis and so um davis is very bike friendly but my wife had to drive to um to to her parents to help take care of her dad and so we just decided to get a a van (laughs) um which we really regretted. We like struggled. I mean, not regretted, but we like really struggled with that because it was like we love living without a car, and it was like part of our identity. And once something becomes a part of your identity, going back to having a car was really tough. But we've embraced it, uh, and we still ride around on bikes a lot. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. We we also went without um, uh, giving Christmas gifts with the kids, uh, or giving experience gifts, or you know like a trip or doing something together as a family. Um, or we would, you know, give them food like baked goods and they like that. And so we've experiment experimented with it as a family with like not giving possessions as gifts. Um, and it's just about an ongoing family conversation about all of this stuff. So yeah, it's been an interesting journey. That's cool. Sure. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Great ideas. I wonder if it, it has your wife ever looked at you and at, at, through this process and been like, Leah, when is this going to stop? <laughs> when are all these uh, experiments I, or these changes? She, uh, well, it's more of an eye roll. Uh, <laughs> right. But, uh, <laughs> she's mastered the eye roll. But it, yeah, it's definitely like, okay, here's Leah doing his crazy stuff again. And then it's funny because she'll always just kind of like, okay, you do your thing. I'm going to do mine. But a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times she'll be inspired be like, oh, that's cool. Mm. And um, want to do that as well. And and uh, to be honest, it's been both ways. It's not like yeah. I'm the only inspirational one. She's inspired me in a lot of ways. She's a really, really strong person. She's gone um, like not only from uh, you know, meat eater to, to vegan, but she's gone from never having exercised in her life when I when I knew her to now being like a fitness buff, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like when I I was starting to work out, I'm like, okay, let's try and do some bodyweight squats. And she would try, she would go down in a bodyweight squat and not be able to come up. And I was like, you're kidding me. You can't stand up from that. And so, and she wasn't, she was like, she would get really mad at me that I was teasing her about that. But now she can not only do bodyweight squats, but she can lift with a barbell and she does kettlebell (laughs) Wow, uh, things and all kinds of cool stuff like that. And so to see her go through that journey has been really inspiring for me. And sometimes when my exercise regimen has has kind of drifted away, to see her working hard uh, inspires me. And she does all kinds of stuff like that. We we uh, unschool the kids, and she's she's a great uh, unschool mom. And so that inspires me as well. Um, and there's a lot of 
cool kind of back and forth. Yeah. Um, things like that. Oh, geez. You just mentioned unschooling. It's oh, one thing so we're like so interested in, but I don't think we should go down that road because <laughs> we have a few other things we want to cover. Um, I'm particularly interested. I've been kind of a, a an online business guy for for a greater part of a decade. And given how thoughtful and conscious you are about approaching things, I'm curious how how a typical work day, if there is such a thing, might look for you, um, how you might design things or structure things in terms of your writing and emails and, and the big categories that if we work online that we have to, to face basically every day. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's definitely been something that I've experimented with a lot in a lot of ways over the years. Um, I've, ha- I've had very structured, like, do this at this time, this at this time, um, things in the past, but those haven't really stuck well with me. Mm. So uh, these days I'm very flexible, but I do have some, like, things that just kind of anchor me in my day, uh, and that really helps, at least for me. So I have, you know, meditation in the morning, um, and now I'm starting to build uh, a little bit of a yoga practice in which, mm. uh, if you know me, um, if you're a friend of mine, you would know that I really need that because my, uh, flexibility is about the worst in the world. Mm. Um, but, uh, it's also yeah, great meditation as well. So anyway, that's kind of the beginning. Um, and I write usually right after that. And those kind of anchor me is right or write sometime early on. Um, I've also been experimenting with only doing email twice a day, which I had done a long time ago and then I got away from it so that I was like checking email as a way to distract myself (laughs) or procrastinate. Um, so now I, I have like two periods in the morning and afternoon email periods and that helps me. And then I'm also getting away from a lot of the online distractions that I've, um, that pull me away from what I think of as my more important work. Um, so things like reading blogs and news and, right. you know, social media, things like that. I've, I'm trying to stay away from it and stay focused on the important work. And so I, I start out my work day by kind of figuring out what my priorities are, doing my writing early, doing an email session, uh, communicating with, you know, various collaborators, team, mem- team members, things like that. Um, and then, um, I'll usually do more important work after that. And then my afternoon is like little stuff because I notice that my energy kind of goes down. And I also have a kind of, not really a cutoff time, but a point where I start to do more stuff with the kids, uh, where there'd be like helping them with, you know, things that they're learning about or just reading with them or going for a walk or a bike ride with them. Um, and so the afternoon evenings start to become my like family time. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of how it is, but there's a lot of flexibility in there. Like sometimes I won't write first thing um, because I have uh, other important work to do. And so I'll, I'll work on that important work first and then do some writing later. Um, yeah. And then specifically with email, one thing that you've written about is keeping your inbox at zero. Mm. I'm curious what your um, parameters are or how you deal with with email and how do you, how do you get them all out of there? Cause <laughs> I almost want to well, say, can you come over please and get all these emails out Stephen of Stephen will point to the, like on my, my iPhone, like 12,000 something oh email God. flag. I mean, it's just, <laughs> mind was and the anxiety that, that produ- produces. <laughs> anyway, I'll let you answer Stephen's well, question. There can, be, there can be anxiety both ways. So that's, that's one thing is just to, again, I, I talked about, uh, understanding your relationship with things. And so understanding my relationship with email has been a really good thing. So I get anxiety when there's too much and I think some people do and other people don't really care about it. So it's just a matter of how you relate to, to the inbox. Um, but I, these days I actually have moved away from inbox zero, which is a Merlin man term, by the way. Um, so he, yeah, he coined that term, but basically it's, it's getting your inbox down to zero Um, And I don't even think he espouses that, honestly. I haven't uh, heard his stuff in a while, but it it, it was about getting my inbox down to zero. And then I realized that there was some anxiety about that, you know, like getting it down to zero. And then what if like it started to fill up again? Mm -hmm. And so like I realized that wasn't a healthy relationship with my email either. So now I kind of try and find that middle ground so that I'll leave a few emails in there and not worry about answering every single one, um, and getting it clear completely each session. But 
I will try and process them um, as much as possible out of the inbox. And there will be a few that are sitting there. And if I notice something sits there for a few days, I realize I've been procrastinating with it for some reason. And now I have to like sit with it and understand why I'm procrastinating on it. <laughs> um, so it's really good to actually see those in there. If, they, if they've stayed for a week, there's some real um, issue that I'm, I'm putting off there. And so it's, it's really good to face that. Um, but also just, just allowing myself to not get it down to empty, just to give myself permission to close the inbox and say, I'm done for the day, even if there are a few more left in there and just let go. Um, so that's been a really good practice for me. And one final question along these lines is there, are there any tools that you use to help, <clears throat> you know, limit your internet time? For example, I, I've, I've tried that freedom app. I'm not sure you've heard of that. Um, it was, yeah. Neil Strauss actually turned me on to that, and uh, oh, cool. and it was helpful, although um, it's it's severe. I'm wondering if you have any <laughs> – you know, there was one day where I thought I really need to check something, and I had to run yeah. in and get on my wife's computer. And so it, it just mm-hmm. – it's it's kind of this Fort Knox of, of access. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm curious if you've tried that or, or anything else like that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I probably tried everything. There's, there's a number of apps. There's Rescue Time. There's – um, I could, I could probably find a whole bunch of them, but, um, yeah, for the same reason that you don't do it, I, I don't use freedom anymore. Uh, just because there are times when you just need to, you know, like I, I, I mentioned two email uh, sessions a day, but there are a few times when I need to just send a quick email or like before we got on this, this pod- podcast interview, I like went and checked to make sure that you didn't like cancel the appointment. Right. And I saw that you had emailed me like an hour before just to, to confirm that we were on. Uh, so just to go in and, and just check on things like that once in a while, I think it's okay to do that. Um, and so to be like completely like blocking out my email program, um, except for these times of the day really restricts me and I'll find ways to get around it. Like you said, go to your wife's computer Maybe you don't have it on your, your phone so you can check your email on your phone. <laughs> uh, there's always a way around it, right? Um, the, oh, actually, the best way that I've done is if I want some completely undistracted time, I'll unplug the router and um, give it to my wife, for example, and say, don't plug it back in until this, <laughs> this time. <laughs> that actually works. But the problem with that is now she and the kids all use the internet. And so I'm basically being selfish if I do that. So I have to figure out other ways right, right. To, to limit myself from distractions. So now what I'm, what I try and do is just say, okay, from this time to this time, I'm only going to do this, or I'm not going to allow myself to go on these sites for the rest of the day or something like that. Or I'll just kind of commit to that to myself. And, um, and when I notice myself breaking that, That's a really good thing for me to do is just notice that I am going towards towards those distractions when I told myself that I wasn't. So I make a promise to myself, a vow, and then when I'm breaking the vow, it's like really good to see that um, that pull. It's like, why am I so pulled from this? And well, the reason is because I really don't want to do this work, (laughs) Um, you know, or, or something like that. Or maybe I just, you know, I'm craving the validation of someone, you know, retweeting one of my tweets or something like that. So I go and check that, get that validation. Um, and so it's really good to understand that about yourself. So again, it's all about learning about my relationship with, with myself and these distractions and my work. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I work with it these days, but yeah, absolutely. If it can be actually a really great way, it's like that lean out diet that I talked about. If you notice your, if you commit to a diet and then you notice yourself going away from the diet, that's a good thing to see. So the diet is a good thing just to notice when you're pulled away from it. And so having a freedom app kind of thing, just saying, okay, for the next few days, I'm, I'm not going to allow myself to do anything but these things or only at these times. When you find yourself pulled towards uh, getting around it for non like urgent reasons, then um, it's a really good thing to understand. It's, it's good to see that relationship with, with your distractions. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, I know before we run out of time with you, I definitely want to return to something you mentioned earlier that we didn't pick up, which is, um, Zen and Buddhism. 
um, and its influence on you. You know, something that we are really interested in exploring with this podcast is the belief systems that underlie transformative changes in people and people who do things differently. So can you talk yeah. to us a little bit more about, you know, the set of beliefs that underpin this quest that you're on to pare things down and, and uh, this quest for simplicity? Yeah, well, definitely in the beginning, um, the set of beliefs were just about improving myself in my life. Um, and with, again, with an uh, underlying like unhappiness with who I was and wanting to be a better person. And there's a very loving thing there of, of wanting to be a better person, of having this hope that you can not be the person that you are that you don't like um, and uh, that your life can be better. And so that there was a loving intention there, but it was a lot of, a lot of just self-criticism and criticism of what was going on in my life. And so I, I realized that after changing um, a lot of things, actually I felt the same way about myself. Uh, I mean, not exactly, but there was still a lot of that self-criticism and self-doubt and self-dislike there. Um, and it was like, no matter what I changed on the outside, that was still there. And it was just this constant drive to get better and better and meet bigger and bigger goals. And um, every time I did, I, the underlying problems were still there. Like I didn't actually find happiness, uh, you know, running to the top of the mountain. I got to the top of the mountain. Like it's, it's not uh, what I was hoping it was going to be. Uh, so the happiness wasn't there. And so I, I realized I had to turn inward to find that happiness. And so I started to explore contentment um, and, uh, and, and just kind of deeper reasons behind doing all of this stuff. And as I did that, I, of course, I started meditating. Um, I started uh, reading about these things and pra you know, practicing uh, with uh, Zen centers and Zen teachers um, and other you know, Buddhist teachers as well, and uh, discovering some really, really useful stuff in there. And um, a lot of it was just about how we look at our, ourselves and the world and uh, what is the root cause of all of these, this unhappiness that we have about ourselves, this frustration that we have with other people, uh, this anxiety we might have about email or, or online distractions. And so as I started to learn more about what was going on, like it starts just like peeling back an onion and you like go deeper and deeper. And I still have a lot of layers to peel. It's not like I'm at the guru, <laughs> guru status yet, <laughs> but <clears throat> it's all about kind of seeing um, what's going on and, and just paying attention to that. So again, the distractions, the frustration, the unhappiness with myself, you can start to see like, for example, stories that you tell yourself about why this other person is being such a jerk to you um, and why can't they just change and be a better person. And so as you start to see these stories that are making you unhappy, you're like, okay, why am I telling myself these stories? Why, why am I making myself unhappy? And so you start to kind of like go deeper into that. And that's, that's really been my, my journey. And I'm, I've, I've learned a lot and I'm still learning a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I find it pretty amazing stuff. Um, and then I guess we, we have a little finale, if you will, <laughs> quest, real quick questions. But I think right. one other thing I want to dig into, there's a few things, but I think in the interest of time, you know, one <clears throat> theme through much of what you've done and discussed today is focus and the power mm -hmm. of focus. And I think one thing that emerges when anybody begins to pare things back and simplify is this question of focus. And mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you talk more about, you know, the notion of doing one thing at a time and maybe, you know, how about how contrarian that is in this world of multitasking and, and a bombardment of messages but the value of being fully present in each thing that you do and how that has uh, made a difference in your life. Yeah. Well, again, this has been a journey for me. So it's interesting. If you read some of my early writings on um, single tasking or focus or doing one thing at a time, it was all about trying to uh, pare back the, uh, the chaos of the world. Like there's so much going on and you're just jumping around and it's just like, okay, let me, let me focus on one thing. And just be fully there with that and just be more effective with that task also just giving it my full attention um, and so that was one thing was about effectiveness and productivity and and mindfulness kind of all blended together and simplicity um, and it really did help me uh, um, deal with all of that chaos uh, going on but 
these days it's it's less about the efficiency and and the focus and more about uh, just how I relate to the world around me. And often it is uh, it's distractions, it's constant distractions, uh, checking the phone, checking the computer, um, and just not paying attention to you know what's here right now. <laughs> and uh, and also as I relate to it. Am I relating it to it in a way where I'm like rejecting it or clinging to something or am I being open hearted towards whatever it is that's there? Um, and so, yeah, as as I've learned about this, it's been a really important practice for me. It's just saying, OK, right now I'm going to just sit and just meditate. And I notice my mind like wanting to go off to all the different things that I have to do today instead of just sitting and just meditating. But as I've learned how to do that and I'm not you know, perfect at it in any way at all. I've learned like I can just drink this water and, and have a glass of water and just pay attention to the process of drinking that water. And that transforms that one sim simple experience, but I can also just be there as some, as my kid talks to me um, and just pay attention to them rather than be like, okay, okay, okay. And do other things while they're talking to me. And just doing that, I think is an act of love of just giving them my full attention and just listening to them. Um, and it's something that I have often not done. Um, and I find that to be a, kind of a, a disrespectful thing when you don't give someone your full attention. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. If I think that this work is worth doing, if I'm going to write something, then isn't it worth doing with my full attention rather than disrespecting it by jumping around to different things? Um, if I think that, you know, taking a shower is worth doing, isn't it worth doing with my full attention or washing a dish or going for a walk rather than being on my phone the whole time, just being there on that walk. And um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of been a, a, a thing that's transformed my relationship with not only the world around me, but with the people around me and, and myself, like I said. Mm. Okay, we're going to do our finale of questions. All right, the hot, the hot seat? <laughs> just hot three, seat. just three. <laughs> okay. Oh, so the first question is, uh, what book or books up to three would you recommend that every human being should read? Oh, wow. Oh, my God. You can't ask a book lover <laughs> to do that. Who was that? Um, we asked somebody that the other day, and they read 500 books a year or something. Yeah. It's like, mm -hmm. how could you possibly read 500 yeah. books a year? <laughs> I don't... Lately, I've been reading just books on like mindfulness and Buddhism. So uh, the one that I'm reading right now, uh, it's very short and easy, but um, her name is Pema Chodron. I don't know if you guys are familiar with sure, her. but of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She's uh, one of the, the great Buddhist teachers uh, in America today. Um, but uh, the, so her book, Dealing with Uncertainty, or wait, what is it called? When Things Fall Apart. Yep. Yeah, that, that one I think is is probably her um, best known book, and I think every human being should read it. But the book I'm reading right now is, um, uh, I can't remember it now, I have it over there, something like Living Beautifully or something like that. But anyway, it's, it's about three different vows, and I'm working with those vows right now, and um, I find it to be amazing, short and succinct, and really the same material um, as... Um, when things fall apart. But anyway, when things fall apart probably would be the top recommendation there. Um, one, one book that transformed my relationship with money is uh, Your Money or Your Life. Mm. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one, but it was all about getting to financial independence uh, by being really frugal and um, cutting back your expenses to the point where you can save and then retire basically early. And I, I'm trying. To, I've read that book, and I and I'm trying to remember the name of the author. We'll put it on the show notes. Yeah, is, is it, it was. Uh, is it like Joe Joe Dominguez or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll put it in the show I, notes. Yeah. But yeah, that was a very anyway. Good there book. it was two authors, but yeah, it, it was amazing. The guy had cut his expenses down to six thousand dollars a year, and he said, "If I can make enough um, investments so that the the." Income from the investments, not the investments themselves, but the income is $6,000 a year. That's all I need to live on for the rest of my life. I could just retire. Yeah. And then he basically just volunteered um, the, his, his time after that, just did work that was meaningful to him for free because he didn't need the money, um, which I found to be an amazing thing. But 
it really inspired me. I don't live on that little, uh, but inspired me to just think about how I was spending my life because that, you know, uh, for everything that I was spending, it actually cost me money that I had to, to work for and spending hours of my life just to pay for that. And I, I started to see that I was actually, everything that I bought was paid for by my life. And so I had to <laughs> decide, is this worth you know, a, a month of my life to buy this thing. Um, and I, I realized like things aren't that important. <laughs> I can stop buying all these things. So that I, I find that to be a great book. Um, trying to think of, there's so many good ones. Uh, I am, I am, uh, okay. I always have to say, uh, Don Quixote. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the great books of all time. Yeah, and he was a genius, I think, up there with Shakespeare. So, yep. And Shakespeare, of course, wrote uh, amazing uh, works, but they weren't books, really. They were plays. And so he was like a contemporary with Shakespeare, and I thought the two of them are two of the greatest uh, fiction writers of all time. Well, those are really three really cool choices. Um, second question, this ought to be interesting is uh, 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 in your shoes, but what thing item or keepsake have you owned for the longest period of time and why have you kept that? Oh, boy. Um, I don't have, I don't, there's no actual, um, possessions that I've kept except for, uh, some old photographs. Uh, I've got actually rid of most of my photographs, but, and I have a couple of old journals that I wrote when I was younger. Mm. Um, and actually, I'm thinking of digitizing those and throwing them out because <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't find the paper. I don't actually look through the paper stuff before, but I kind of like that there's a snapshot of my thinking, you know, uh, 20 years ago. And so I like that idea of just just kind of having this who was Leo 20 years ago kind of thing. So um, but I, the actual possessions, there aren't any that I feel um, attached to enough to, to keep them. Even like gifts, things for my wife, like I'll let them go. Um, I've lost my wedding ring a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard the end of it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so yeah, uh, possessions aren't that great, but I, I love memories, especially ones that, that help me to get an insight into who I used to be. It's kind of fun to see that. Hmm. And the third question is, what have you learned in the last 30 days that you think every person should know? Oh, wow. Man, these are great questions. Um, and it doesn't have to be right to 30 days. Either. <laughs> Just, you know, recent history. Yeah. Um, one thing I'm starting to pay more attention to is how often I reject uh, things about the present moment. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, if someone is interrupting me and I'm trying to do some work, I might get like irritated with them. And so I'm irritating their call for my attention. I mean, I'm, I'm rejecting their call for my attention. Um, or it might just be a certain taste in the food that I don't like, um, or just something, something that someone does in a way that I don't like. Uh, so there's all kinds of things about every moment. So I'm constantly evaluating my experience for whether I like it or not. So I either like this and I really want to hold on to it, or I don't like this and I want to get rid of it. And instead, there could just be a less attached, like I don't need to cling to something that I like, and I don't have to reject things that I don't like, and so I can just kind of um, work with it, just observing it and even embracing it and let, letting it in in a, in a wholehearted way and just kind of ex experiencing everything as like enlightened activity. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that I'm learning a lot about. It's not something I've only learned about in the last 30 days, but in the last 30 days, I've been paying a lot more attention to it and just seeing how often I reject things. And so um, the, the commitment, and this is in the, the book that Pema writes about, um, the commitment is to not act on that rejection and, and act out or speak out in a way like, where I'm irritated with someone, um, which is a real challenge. <laughs> so I just like, don't, don't say anything. And instead I just turn towards the feeling, which is a feeling of not liking something. It's a feeling of feeling groundlessness or uncertainty and just kind of 
learning to uh, be there with that feeling. And if you just be there with it, it doesn't have to, you don't have to act out on it. You don't have to like lash out at someone. You can just stay with it and it doesn't have to um, uh, force you to do anything. You can just be comfortable with it. And so that's, that's something that I'm learning how to do. I wouldn't say I've mastered it, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> it's something that I think every human being should learn how to do. I'm, I, I'm writing books about it. I've, I've just done a course that's kind of on this, and I'm going to do a retreat uh, pretty soon in San Francisco where we kind of go deeper into this kind of stuff. This is one of the things uh, that I want to work with people on. But I think everyone, if everyone learned to do this, it would be a lot, a lot uh, more peaceful world. Yeah, no doubt. Um... Well, that's beautiful. I think. Um, well, I think we ought to we ought to close. We're we're a little over time. Thank you for being generous with us. Um, before before, you, so before we before we end, um, where should people connect with you online? And, and perhaps more to what you were just speaking about. What what should folks know about what's coming up for you? Any new books or content or courses, things like that. Yeah, well, I'm not really sure when the podcast will come out. It's you know, you never know when you record it when it'll come out. But I think this is probably three weeks away from today. Okay. Yeah. So um, my blogs and habits net is the main place. I have a Twitter account there that you can see at the bottom. I think. Um, but uh, yeah, I have a retreat that's coming up. Uh, it'll be April. Uh, I don't know if people are going to be listening to this after that, but. It'll be April, um, and people can sign up for that. Uh, but there's a course that I'm doing. I'm, I just mentioned that, which is a video course. It's a, let's see, four-week video course, and um, it's about dealing with struggles. And a lot of it is kind of going deeper into the stuff that I just talked about. So I encourage people to check that out. Um, but, yeah, just read my blog. Uh, you'll get a lot of this stuff for free. <laughs> what's, the, what's the name of that course? Um, it's called Dealing with Struggles. Dealing with Struggles. Got it. Okay. Yeah. We'll I've go. actually realized in the last year that that is what I now think of as my life's work, <laughs> is helping people who are dealing with struggles, which turns out to be every single human being. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> even Pema Chodron, <laughs> uh, human being, uh, even Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama, like every single human being has some kind of struggle, whether it's financial or health or, you know, dealing with finding their lives calling or dealing with some irritating thing in their lives or just feeling unhappy with themselves. We all have something that we're struggling with. And I find this to be, I, I decided that this is my life's work is learning how to help people with it hmm. and doing my best to do that. That's beautiful. Well, Leo, thanks a lot. We'll, we'll certainly link in the show notes to your print book, The Power of Less, which we've gotten a lot out of. It's a beautiful read. Um, and I'm guessing that Twitter is kind of the social media place for you. Is that where you, you're you most active? Yeah, I don't – I'm actually not on there too too much, but I post all my blog posts on there and okay. uh, other announcements, things like that. Yeah, I try not to post too much. <laughs> yeah. Well – Thanks a lot for this, Leo. It's been a real honor and a privilege talking to you. Yeah, thanks, Leo. It's been such a fantastic and inspiring conversation. So uh, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, well, I'm glad. And I I have been inspired uh, by talking to you guys. It's always uh, amazing to have this opportunity to talk to you, people about this kind of stuff. So I, I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Well, that's it for this week's On Stream podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. We do hope you enjoyed this terrific conversation with Leo Babauta. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode for links to everything mentioned, including Leo's website, his book, of course, The Power of Less, all the other books he mentioned. Uh, we will definitely link over to his Sea Change program and, of course, his Twitter, everything we talked about. All of that can be found at ownstream.co backslash Leo Babauta. That's ownstream.co backslash L-E-O B-A-B-A-U-T-A. Also, before we let you go, please sign up for our weekly tip-off email at ownstream.co and just click the sign up button in the upper right-hand corner. This is where we share each Monday three cool things we've learned in the last week in the areas of lifestyle, business, and spirit. 
This could be an amazing quote, individual, tip, or tool designed to bring you more freedom and power in your life. So definitely sign up for that, again, at ownstream.co, and just click sign up. Finally, we have just started our very own Facebook page, and we would love it if you liked us at facebook.com backslash ownstream. And be the first to know about new podcast episodes, uh, new blog content, and cool stuff related to our personal journey. Also, we're on Twitter at ownstream and on Instagram, where we do post regularly at own underscore stream. Thanks so much, and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to the OwnStream podcast. To learn more and connect with us, please visit ownstream.co or follow us on Twitter at OwnStream and Instagram at own underscore stream.